Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the DCE webinar series. If you don't already know, Data Centric Engineering is an open access journal published by Cambridge University Press. We're delighted to be bringing you this webinar series, thanks to our editors and the support of the Lloyd's Register Foundation and Alan Turin Institute. Today, we're joined by a special guest speaker, George M. Karnidakas, and in a moment, I'll hand over to Mark Gorolami, the Editor-in-Chief of Data Centric Engineering. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have all joined in listen-only mode, which means you'll be able to hear us, but not able to speak to us. However, you have the opportunity to submit chat questions by typing your questions into the Q&A of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the webinar. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. If we are unable to get through all the questions during the session today, they will be included in the Q&A document that we will send after the webinar. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please add this to the questions box or the chat box and a member of the organising team will endeavour to help you. In the unlikely event we experience any issues, we will message the audience and restart the webinar. So to summarize, you can submit your questions at any time and you'll also receive a survey at the end to know how useful you found it and another opportunity to ask any questions. I'd like to encourage all of you to use the Twitter hashtag DCE webinar series to share your thoughts on the event and start meaningful conversations. To kick things off, I'd like to invite Mark, the Editor-in-Chief of Data Centric Engineering to start. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And it's absolutely fantastic to see so many of you joining us in this first web webinar uh, of the Data Centric Engineering Journal. Uh, my colleague, Luca uh, Magri, is going to be chairing the session today. So I, I don't want to take up uh, too much time but there's a couple of things that I, I just want to, to mention. The first one is, is that the data-centric engineering journal published by Cambridge University Press is new. And although the journal is new, the fact that engineering, engineering science and uh, its practice is data-centric is not new at all. And that's one thing that it has to be made absolutely clear that data, that measurement, that observation has always been core to the engineering sciences and to the practice of the engineering discipline. But what is different now is that the ability to gather data at multiple levels of scale, multiple levels of granularity, multiple levels of volume, and give us insights into some of the, the real mysteries of physical phenomena that we just cannot describe, such as turbulence uh, and, and so on, um, is, 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 is available uh, in, in such a way that it is completely transforming the way that we do engineering and indeed the way in which the, the business of engineering uh, actually takes place. And so, with our first speaker of this webinar series, George Karniadakis. Um, I'm delighted uh, that, that George agreed to, to kick off this webinar series. George is one of the advisory board members uh, of the journal. Um, and, and George has, has, has been a, 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 you know, a trendsetter, has, has been a pathfinder. Um, he was one of the original developers uh, of computational engineering and computational science. And now in today's talk, you'll hear him uh, talking about this data-centric view where both physics, machine learning and AI um, are all pushing forward our understanding of complex engineering systems. So in closing, before I hand over to Luca, I would encourage you to visit the data-centric engineering journal website and I would encourage you even more so to think about submitting your work 
uh, to the journal uh, and certainly reading uh, many of the articles that, that have appeared uh, and that will appear uh, in the near future. So let me hand over to, to Luca now to introduce uh, our, our speaker for today, uh, George Karniadakis. Luca. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, well, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending where you are, uh, to all of you. So I'm very delighted and pleased to uh, introduce um, Professor Kanyadakis. George Kanyadakis got his PhD in MIT in 87, and he was appointed um, as a lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. And subsequently, he joined the uh, Center for Turbulence Research at Stanford, NASA, Ames. He then uh, was appointed at Princeton University as an assistant professor in mechanical engineering and uh, um, applied in computational mathematics and uh, took up a visiting professorship at Caltech in 93. Then he joined Brown University where, where he is now as associate professor of applied mathematics in the center for fluid mechanics in 94, becoming full professor in 96, where um, he, will, he was already continuing keeping the visiting professorship of, um, at MIT in the ocean mechanical engineering. So he's a fellow of a numerous um, important, uh, you know, um, associations, Triple uh, AS, uh, fellow of APS, SIAM, um, and uh, uh, associate fellow of uh, AIAA. And uh, he received very prestigious uh, awards and prizes. Very recently, uh, the SIAM ACM uh, Prize on Computational Science and Engineering in 21 this year, uh, the Alexander uh, von Humboldt Award in, in 17, the Siam Kleinman Award in 2018, and the Oden Medal, which is another very prestigious medal in 2013, and the CFD Award in 2007 by the US Association of Computational Mechanics. And um, according to Google Scholar, his uh, impact is uh, measured by a uh, number of citations uh, over 55,000 with an H index, which is uh, um, 108. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over the talk uh, to George, who's gonna um, talk about approximating functions, functionals and operators using deep neural networks for diverse applications. Over to you, George. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luca. Can you please see my screen? Yeah, that's all good. Uh, also the video and the coffee. Yeah, great. Yes, thank you very much, Luca. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Mark, for this invitation. And uh, I wish the best for the um, timely uh, launching of this journal. So the, in fact, the um, problems that my group and I have been looking at the last uh, five years is exactly that, is data-centric problems, non-sterilized problems, uh, which um, cannot be directly tackled with uh, methods in standard computational mechanics that have been developed over the years. Uh, and this is an example, what I show here is in fact um, uh, the um, uh, flow over an espresso uh, cup. I, I drink lots of espressos. And um, I, I team up with this company in Germany in, in Gettigen La Vision. So they, I asked them, uh, I will talk about them later, but I asked them, say, do me a favor and tell me how, uh, if they can give me some measurements. Uh, so they took their six cameras of Schlieren photography and they gave me a 3D uh, images like this. Um, and I wanted, of course, to see how fast the aroma uh, hits my uh, nose. Uh, of the coffee, uh, you say, well, that's, a no, that's a not an engineering problem. It's a problem that, uh, of course, is um, iconic to many difficult problems that we have in, in engineering, where we have some data, we have some physics, we don't know the boundary conditions, we don't have well-posedness that we're used to, and we don't solve forward problems, we don't solve invest problems, we, we solve these hybrid mix problems that uh, Mark alluded to by, by this data-centric uh, uh, approach. So. Uh, let me um, uh, formalize this, what I mean, and, and uh, here in the past, what we had is this um, paradigm. We had um, uh, a lot of physics where we know all uh, the entire equations, and then we have some data for the boundary in the initial conditions, and we pretend that we know all the parameters, and, and then uh, we develop numerical methods to, to forecast uh, what's going to happen in the future. Of course, there's so many uncertainties, so we have to, to uh, resort to data. And, and many times in real problems, we know some of the physics. For example, in reactive transport, you know, you never know uh, the 100 reactions constants uh, that are taking place at least in, um, 
reactive transport that would be combustion or it could be um, uh, in uh, biomedical engineering. So, so you need data to improvise, you need data. So you have this hybrid model. So for that, I will introduce this uh, physics informed neural network. It could also be a case where you're looking at to totally different phenomena. And then one, of course, would be uh, social dynamics. But even in, in, in engineering, if you have a very, very complex uh, flow or, or uh, flow structure interactions or combustion and so on, you may have a lot of data from some measurements or from some simulations, but you don't know exactly the equations. One could reconstruct, uh, discover the operator at the system identification level. Imagine a system that consists of many systems, systems of systems that are uh, fashionable these days. So there are three different, these three different scenarios that I, I want to talk about today is the last two are the ones that we're really um, um, focusing in the last few years. And I was, I worked very closely with the, with the army and they told me that uh, in the army, they have this 5D law, not just now because of AI, but they always had this law that their data is dinky, small, dirty, dynamic, uh, sort of noisy, dynamic, streaming and deceptive because the enemy is always uh, there, uh, otherwise known as fake news. So, so you have this data and you have, uh, and you have some physical laws. So we introduced this, um, uh, this, this work. Uh, we now have a, a patent on physics informed learning. Uh, it was just issued a couple of days ago after three years of, uh, of examination, worse than a paper in, uh, in some of the journals. But anyway, we introduced this um, back in, in 2017 in, um, in two papers, the forward problem, the inverse problem. And that is this hybrid model. How do you uh, merge data and neural networks <clears throat> and physics uh, together? And so that we call that PIN. So here's a schematic of what uh, a PIN is. So there's this left part, which if you can see my, my pen here on the left, that, uh, that basically I want to find u as a function of x and t, position and time. If I have enough data, let's say 10,000 measurements, 100,000 measurements, I can find these links. These are my weights and the bias. Sigma here will be some activation function. And the math is very boring, in fact, very simple. I just have a, um, this type of uh, mismatch in the data, and the squares or some other norm. You minimize that norm. Uh, and, and you find the minimum, and therefore you, you know implicitly you as a function of X and T. <clears throat> of course, in engineering, we don't have 10,000 measurements. We have few measurements, and these measurements are not at the right place where the math would require them. But we also know from mathematical physics that U has to satisfy the same U that, um, uh, for which we're given data, has to satisfy some equations. For example, here, I pretend I have this nonlinear Schrodinger equation and notice that my equation has also parameters. I don't know these parameters. So I can introduce a parameterized equation here and you, of course, has to satisfy this equation. Also, I introduce these operators, these differential operators, which typically in numerical analysis and scientific computing, we compute, will um, express them through um, uh, a grid or through an expansion. Here we use automatic differentiation, the tool that uh, the same automatic differentiation that is used in back, back propagation of the error in neural networks, I use the same one. So therefore I avoid having grids, I avoid the tyranny of mesh generation in engineering. If you, if you do, a, do a gearbox, it may take you a month to build a gearbox. So here we don't need to do that. We can compute this. So all these operators, we can compute this uh, using automatic differentiation, which of course it's, it's, it's um, wonderful because we differentiate the network um, and the network here means the parameters that, that uh, are here. So, so the right-hand side here and the left-hand side, the right-hand side is the informed part, physics informed, the left-hand side is the data informed. The right-hand side could also uh, contribute to the loss function. So because we want to minimize F, which is the residual, we want that to be zero. So then we take the two together, we can put some weights lambda one and lambda two, and we form the loss function. Then we send the loss function to an Adam optimizer, to LBFGS and so on, standard tools, and we are done. So it's a very, very simple um, idea. The method is really, really simple. High school students can do it. Yeah, uh, and I, I have a piece of code to show you how we can do this, uh, how this works for the simple equation, the Berger's equation. So we have a non-linearity, we have second derivative. So this, this first definition here, this is really the left part. This defines the network. 
So I define a deep neural network with so many layers and so on. Then I have here, I have four lines of TensorFlow. TF stands for TensorFlow. So I compute the first derivative in time, second derivative in space. I add them up and I form here the second term, which is penalizing the uh, residual at some points and then having the data. In this particular example, and again, it's very important to say that the variable t and the variable x, all the variables, independent variables, are not discretized. They're continuous variables. So now I have this xt domain, and I pretend that I have data, could be my initial conditions, it could be my boundary conditions here, where the star, the star points are, but notice this region here. This region has no data, uh, boundary data. In fact, I could avoid having any data on this side, because here we're not doing the classical time marching and so on, so we don't really need to have the lax type of, of well-posedness and stability for convergence. Here we're solving optimization problems. So this term, the physics term, I compute it at random points inside my domains. So notice, of course, I can uh, do also something called mini batch. If you want to have it one trillion points in your simulation, you can do that because you can do a mini batch and put the spotlights on only the points that you want every iteration until you complete an epoch. Okay, so this is, as I said, this is very simple. Even professors can program their own ideas now, uh, which is kind of nice freedom. Uh, we don't need graduate students anymore. I'm just kidding. Uh, we need them. We need them to, to think. Uh, but basically, 10 minutes later, you get solutions like this, which are uh, pretty good looking. I've been working on medical methods for this type of stuff for a long time. So this continuous galeric would never get this type of, of, of uh, accuracy. Now, there's, there are other variants of, of pins. I will show you one for the same problem. Again, this is the Berger's equation. This is my space spatial variable. This is a time variable. Not, notice now I have two domains. I have the, the C, the blue C, and I have this dolphin. The reason I choose that is to, so, is to, to demonstrate that we can have arbitrary decompositions in space-time. And, and by doing that, I can assign one neural network on one side, very important for multi-physics problems, another neural network on the other side. And then how I glue those together, I make my residual, my total residual to be continuous because the residual has to be zero everywhere and therefore has to be continuous at this red interface. By penalizing the residual of the interface thing of Lagrangian multiplier, you basically produce solutions like this, which are seamless. If you work on finite elements or any domain decomposition method, you know that the error is always largest at the boundaries. Uh, this is not the case here because you can totally control this error. So there are multiple advantages of this flexibility. I can have non-convex domain, no other domain decomposition method can, have, can, can handle this type of domains. I can have parallelism because I can have a GPU here on, on GPU one and GPU two. I can have different neural networks. Notice that I have different size of neural network, but also different activation functions. Different, uh, uh, I want to capture the nonlinearities differently. So that gives you tremendous flexibility. And the simplicity is, as, uh, is, is similar to what I showed you before in the loss function, you will penalize the residual across these uh, different domains. Let me show you an example of this because as I, I, I talked about multiphysics and last year we published a paper in science um, uh, with the title Hidden Fluid Mechanics. Uh, we're interested in fluid mechanics. We're interested to uh, see what can you get from what is now qualitative visualizations. For example, uh, I asked my postdoc, if you have some dye visualized behind a, a bluff object, right? And you have a video of that. What can you say? Can you, for example, tell me what the pressure is there? Can you tell me what the velocity is there? Clearly, because I don't have boundary conditions, I don't know the Reynolds numbers. I don't, it's, it's a nil pose problem. I cannot do that with my other methods that I have. Uh, so, so we set up now a similar neural network. Notice that all the physics now is here. All these operators, the passive scalar, which is coupled to the Navier-Stokes equation, incompressibility and so on, all that goes into one loss function with appropriate weights. And that this is one neural network. If we learn the, the, the parameters, weights and bias uh, for, for, for each one of, of these variables, and so we have multiple variables here, then I can solve this multi-physics problem very quickly. Not, so the, the whole code here will take about 100 lines. 
not 100,000 lines that uh, open foam and nectar and other codes have. Nectar is our spectral learning code and nectar plus plus and so on. So what you can see here, and you can take a look at our science paper, we can, this is just a snapshot, but we can actually get a, get a sequence Wherever the dye is, this is where the dye is. We match the dye. That's my data. My data is only on the video. Uh, and then I can get the velocity fields. I can get the pressure. Uh, and if I allow the dye to go around the, the, ob the object, I can even get the forces within a couple of percent in, in drag and the lift coefficients. OK, here's another example, which is kind of timely. Last, um, about uh, almost a year ago, we, we saw this video on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, this is now my collaborator, Thomas Berg from La Vision. And as you can see, he's puffing uh, with and without the mask. And uh, he's using Slyrian photography. So that's sort of density gradients of the air. So I asked my postdoc, can you take that data and quantify the velocity field around his mouth? Can you quantify the pressure and so on? I want to show you here on the bottom that this is now the pressure quantified. We know exactly what the pressure is at each point continuous. And then this is with the mask, you can see. And we also have the velocity. For example, we could find that the velocity with the mask is roughly speaking, 10 times smaller than the velocity without the mask. Going, going back to my favorite example, uh, just having data. These are 3D data I only show here, uh, the uh, 2D. I match the data in the temperature and there, and this is now for free. This, this, this here is free. I get the velocity and I get the pressure field, 3D actually. Uh, for free. And this is uh, my last, uh, I think it's now in general fluid mechanics. Uh, and this gives me also the opportunity to show you uh, th th this, this um, review article that we have, which will come out in uh, Nature Physics Reviews on physics informed learning. What is the concept? How do you approach it? Uh, not just in fluid mechanics, but across all um, branches of physics and chemistry, how that can be um, uh, incorporated. Uh, using neural networks. I have one uh, more application to show you. This is our latest paper on, in PNAS. So we introduced some non-experimentalists, but I like to work closely with the experimentalists. And uh, I work here with my longtime collaborators from MIT, Ming Dao and Subra Suresh. And they um, built this um, microaneurysm on the chip. These are uh, microaneurysms uh, for um, the, in the retina of uh, diabetic people. So we, you can see here we have different types of and sizes of, of uh, and this is real blood. Real blood is not very easy to visualize. I work now with um, TSI and, 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 and uh, La Vision because they're both interested in adopting this technology, AIV. But basically what we did, we took that video in one slide and because we knew the boundary conditions now in these micro channels, we're able to extract 3D motion, 3D motion from only one, from only 2D slices, as you can see here. This gives you an idea. And this is very difficult because it's a very dense suspension, so there are not many methods can do it. Then we wanted to, to actually, of course, it's important to go all the way to the wall. No other method, including all the methods that TSI has, P, PIV or any sophisticated method, cannot go to the wall. The wall is very important because that's where the wall shear stress is. Most importantly, we capture, as I said, the 3D motion. So I, um, I, I, um, if, you, if you do AIV in, P, in PNAS, you will see. Um, AIV stands for artificial intelligence velocimetry instead of PIV, particle image velocimetry. So as I said, the, these methods are agnostic to physics, to, to the particular physics. So here we're looking at solid mechanics uh, in uh, hyperelastic materials. So again, you have some equations. You don't know, need to know exactly the equation. For example, you may not know the Poisson ratio, the shear modulus, and so on. Uh, but you have some measurements. So you have a specimen like this. And you have some measurements where I have the red points. And you do a simple test. Of course, you can have elastography, which will give you a whole patch. But here I want to show you that with sparse data and, and physics, some physics, we can extract and ask, answer questions like, what is the porosity of the medium, of this medium? Uh, what is, if there's an inclusion, what is the, the uh, modulus of elasticity of, the, of, the, what, of, the, of what's in the void and so on? So here I show you that we don't know the geometry. We try, this is a very difficult problem. Finite elements will take at least a year to do it because you don't know the topology. So, so uh, even good codes like Abaku. So we start with the wrong geometry. We parameterize here as an ellipse. We find the ellipse very quickly. You can see the deformation is huge. 
not only we find the geometry at the same time we have the deformation. So in one shot, in one optimization shot, very quickly, you can see here convergence of the orientation of the ellipse and so on. If you don't know the shape, of course, you can do an, a, a splines and, and parameterize with small points and so on. That's not difficult. This is a real example from the Air Force. We won this uh, uh, DARPA hackathon a year ago. There were like 10, 12 teams and they were given data by ultrasound. There's a surface crack here, the ultrasound that hits the, the crack. And of course, there's the reflection. This is the real data here on the left. And this is what we match with the neural network on the right. As you can see, there's a crack here. And of course, and, and we match it as you can see, the simulated data follow um, um, very closely uh, the, um, what, the ultrasound. We actually use only 10% of the ultrasound. Uh, none of the teams were able to solve this problem because of the noise. And they, cl they, com they complained that they didn't have enough data. We had too much data. We, we use only 10% of the data because we use the physics. We took the wave equation and we make this C to be a function of X and Y. You can see here, that's the speed of sound in that piece of metal. It's a nickel alloy. Uh, it's a real thing. And by, as you can see here, the contouring of C at, at the level equals zero, C equals zero, will give you exactly characterizing, will characterize that uh, surface crack. So with 10% data, we're able to nail this problem. We uh, wrote some papers. Recently, the most recent paper we did, it's actually to quantify also the microstructure of nickel alloys that are used in um, gas turbine bl blades because the microstructure changes there. And, uh, and if there's defects, it's very difficult to, to uh, isolate them. So this is real, this become technology and that's, that's why lots of companies are interested in this. Um, we've been very active uh, around the world. There's lots of, um, uh, lots of papers published in, in, uh, in this type of things, but uh, we have developed what the equivalent of discontinuous galerkin with C pins, variational pins like HP type. Uh, we have uh, uh, a lot on, on stochastic. I wish I had time today um, to talk about stochastic PDS because we have great stuff using a generative adversarial network. Um, I like fractional calculus, if you, if you know some of my work. You know, I publish a lot in, in fractional calculus. Uh, and and the, I al already show you extend pins and Bayesian pins where we can quantify uncertainties. UQ is huge in this field, um, much more important than uh, with standard solvers. There's this library called DeepXD, uh, which has 100,000, 110,000 uh, downloads from, from last year. And there's a SIAM review paper that explains this, but DeepXDEX stands for any PDE or ODE, could be also integral equations. Uh, so this is the educational um, uh, uh, framework in Python and, and TensorFlow, anybody can use it. It has a, a relatively simple um, uh, interface also for some uh, more complex geometry, not just squares and cubes uh, and so on. So, so that's the first part of my talk. I want to talk about something really, really important, autonomy. And uh, let me do a, a check. Anybody can see my screen? There's a this destroyer, it's the US Navy DGX. I have worked for the last 20 years on this destroyer for various aspects. Uh, Luca, can you see the video? Yes. Okay. So this destroyer, uh, it's a real one, goes through um, North Atlantic at Sea State 8. Sea State 7, for those of you who sail, is extreme. Sea State 8, nobody should go out there, but the waves 20 meters and so on. And it's supposed to be an autonomous DGX, right? No, no crew on, on board. So they have, so, so um, it has to find its way. It has to find, it has to uh, know its, uh, its motion, the, the, what's called sea keeping, dynamic sea keeping, characterized by six degrees of freedom. And ob obviously you have this uh, oblique waves uh, stochastic excitation. This corresponds to the North Atlantic spectrum uh, of the sea. Now, I couldn't do this work at Brown. I had to do this work with MIT where the students are very patient. So one of these simulations takes one week in open foam. So if you are to use CFD to predict the motion to do autonomy, good luck. It would never happen. And that's why, uh, for other reasons, data-driven also doesn't work well. So what we did instead, we train a neural network and we try to say, can we approximate a, a functional? Because I want to, to produce 
the six degrees of freedom as a function of the stochastic excitation at various C states, right? You dial a C state, you dial a spectrum of a C, uh, can I predict the motion of, of this destroyer? And then I can control it. So, so I was interested from a theoretical point of view, can we actually approximate functionals using neural networks? Because as you may know, uh, the, uh, the 100,000 papers that were published last year on neural networks all use the universal approximation theorem for, for function, not functionals. But I found this obscure paper, one of the best kept secret papers by Chen and Chen from Fudan University that uh, reassured me that, uh, in fact, it had no citations. Uh, this paper had no citations. Now they cited because of far work. Uh, but it, it basically says, yes, there's a universal approximation of neural networks. In fact, a single layer, both for 1D case, but also ND case. So then how do you do it? In this simple case, if you look carefully here, the mathematical expression, uh, one, let me go back here. This is the input. This will be the stochastic excitation. This is the, the uh, degree of freedom, the uh, function that you want to, let, let's say, rolling as a function of time. So we just uh, use a standard uh, recurrent neural network, an LSTM. So, so we um, uh, send different types of excitation, the neural network. It took about uh, three months to do the simulation because the, those simulations are very expensive. So we have to take segments and improvise and so on. And this is now three degrees of freedom, rolling, heaving, pitching. There's another three degrees of freedom, but these are the most three important ones. So the input, this, so the input is a function, the output is a function. So here's an operator. In this particular case, uh, we call it the function. So here you can see the results. This is for one excitation. This is just a different excitation. These are excitations that that we have not used before. So these are new unseen data. And here, I don't know if you can see this, the heave, the pitch, and the roll. The roll is uh, uh, it's tricky. But anyway, uh, the CFD simulation is shown in, uh, in the background, it takes one week. This simulation with, with, uh, took 0.1 second to predict. 0.1 second, now we're talking about real time uh, uh, navigation and, and autonomy. So we want to take this further. Can you generalize this from not just a functional, but an operator? In other words, I won't have a function as an input and I want to have, let's say a 3D velocity field as an output. And, and I may not know this operator. It's a, it would be a multi-scale operator. It could be a black box system, could be, but it could be also an explicit operator. Here I have lots of explicit operators. For example, it could be a PDE. It could be an integral. It could be a stochastic PDE. It could be a Laplace transform. So I have, Operators that I define in a broader sense, explicit mathematical operators, stochastic operators, fractional operators, but also multi-scale operators, which operate in the nano and the continuum regime where we have different uh, heterogeneous mathematical descriptions. Can I come up with that? The answer is yes, because I will go back to Chen and Chen again, but here's what I'm talking about, why this is important. We, grow from, we go from function to operator. So when you go from function to even all this, success in ImageNet and so on, we go from a finite dimensional space to a finite dimensional space like here. When we go from, when we talk about operator, we have to map one uh, infinite dimensional space to another infinite dimensional space. And as I said, the operator could be mathematical operators, could be kernels, it could be a dynamical system, OD or PD or stochastic PD, it could be a biological system or it could be a social system for which we don't even know how to write down the equations. So how can we learn operators via neural networks and how, how do we do that? That's the thing that I want to finish my talk with. Okay, so again, if I go back to Chen and Chen, in 1995, they wrote another paper, best kept secret, uh, that this is a little different. It says that if I take the inputs, let's call the input U from a compact space V, okay, and G, is the unknown operator, it will be a nonlinear continuous operator for now, for the, for the theorem. Then it turns out that there is a neural network, if I, in fact, uh, with a single layer, the single layer, so that I can approximate this G of U of Y, and Y is the output space. The output space is a continuous space, okay? And, and by given by this approximation, this approximation has two terms, one is the branch and one is the trunk. This is associated with the input. 
and this is associated with the output. My output, because I will input the function in the continuous output uh, the domain, is also a neural network. You can see here I have a sigma and I also have a sigma, so I have two neural networks. So it's a composition of two neural networks, the input and the output working together, and then I can get the arbitrary uh, small uh, good accuracy. Now the question is, here talking about operators, how about the case of dimensionality? In other words, if I, um, yes, you can have an approximation, but with a single layer, can you actually uh, do this? Is it practical and so on? We know now that deep neural networks are more expressive, so we wanted to um, we wanted to uh, extend this theorem. So uh, in in the paper we just published in Nature Machine Intelligence, we um, extended uh, this the, the branch and the trunk to arbitrary deep neural networks. In fact, one could be a CNN, the other one could be a fully connected network and so on. But let me show you what, how we turn the math into a neural network. This was the original Chen and Chen theorem, okay? So you can see here, I take this term, and I may, let's look at, at um, uh, panel D, I make it a, um, an, an input. So that's a neural network because I can approximate this. I, I have a proof, but I, I, I don't have time to show, you, to show you the proof. I can approximate this, this function. So I sample this function with M points, how you sample it. This is the input space V, and of course VM will be a subspace, but how I sample it is very, very important. I'll show you an example. And then I make the, uh, my output as a continuous output is here. So notice that this is a sum over P. This is the, out, the outside loop. And then I have at P points here, P points here, I cross them and I get G of U of Y is a function and it could be multiple functions. In fact, it could have multiple excitations. So let's see how this works. Uh, again, the setup is as follows. I want to discover G, so to represent it with a neural network. So U will be mapped to a G of U. So I train with one function and then I observe the output, another function, I observe the output. How many points? Well, here, I have M sensors for the input, but notice here for the output, I only take a couple of points. In other words, um, and that's from our experience, we don't need a lot of observations. We don't need a lot of label data because that would require a lot of experiments, a lot of experimental data. So we construct this composite neural network of a branch and a trunk. And here's an example, the simplest example of all. We take an integrand and we want to map it to an integral Notice X is in an interval zero to one, it could be from zero to infinity. So you can do Laplace transform and we have done that. But this is a simple example to set the stage. So how many of these guys you take? Well, you take a thousand, you take a hundred thousand, you take, I took 10,000. And then how you sample them? I sample them with M equals 100 here, a hundred sensors, uniformly is, uh, or, or randomly. And then I only take one training point. In other words, I evaluate S at only one point. X, of course, belongs to zero to one or zero to infinity. You can have an infinite number of, but I only need one label to train it. After you train it, this is now train a testing error. You can see here that the testing error for unseen new functions from that space V uh, basically a very, very, the, the training error is slightly above testing error. So we have a great generalization error. Here I compare on the right different types of neural networks. This depot net has very small generalization error, the difference between testing and training error. Now, we discovered something surprising, which we now know because of the, we have theory about it, but, but we took this double pendulum and now the excitation will be U of T. Now notice that I have one input function and I have two outputs, S1 and S2. So you can mix and match, that doesn't really matter. But the point of this slide is the following, if we, if I concentrate here in the middle one, it shows the generalization error and the testing error. Basically, here I have the number of training data. Like I said, if you're trying to achieve a certain accuracy, it could be that the accurate, to, to achieve a certain accuracy, the number of training data should may explode. But what do we see here in this plot? We see that we get exponential convergence. Exponential convergence of deep onet that has never been observed before. Unfortunately, when we saturate the neural network, we go back to sampling one over x squared, square root of x. Okay, algebraic convergence. Now, I demonstrate here that if I increase the width 
fate or the, the depth of the neural network, I can move this transition point from exponential to algebraic to the right. Unfortunately, I don't have yet the best neural network. So, so my hope is that one of you in the audience will come up with a neural network that this curve will go all the way because the theory supports it. We have theory, as I said, I will mention later. Now, this neural network does not, is very democratic, does not discriminate against any calculus. And that's why I like it. In fact, it can learn fractional calculus better than, than some of my colleagues. So, so we, we took these functions, okay, we, we said, okay, can you learn the Caputo derivative? And then, of course, we, we have methods to compute the Caputo derivative, so all these functions. So I, I set a loss function like that, but you can see schematically. Here's the input, this goes here. These are the labels. So, so we have the labels here on the output. We train it, and then, and then after that, uh, okay, just a Caputo derivative is, is an ugly a singular integral, as you can see here. So it's not trivial to, to learn the Caputo derivative, but it does learn it. And the purpose of this slide is to concentrate on this mid, in this middle slide to, to show you that. It shows the mean square error versus the training data. But now I have multiple curves. Before, my space V was a Gauss random field. Okay, now, to tell, as you know, Gauss random field actually violates the theorem. The theorem is asking for a compact set. But, but it turns out that in practice, the the we don't need to do that. And the new theory we have, we remove that, that um, constraint. But most importantly, how you represent V is very important. So if it, GRF, you get this, if I was using a smarter way, using spectral methods, for example, what I have here, polyfractonomials, it's like Jacob polynomials, or wavelets, you can see I can gain two orders of magnitude by making my V space or the same number of training data. If I choose a smart input space, I can uh, reduce the error by two orders of magnitude. And of course, that's very important because we're training operators. Uh, this typo net can learn stochastic operators. Here's a stochastic PDE classical for porous media. For porous media. We make this to, to make it easy for ourselves, a correlated a, a color noise, correlate noise. So we do a Cartesian loev expansion. What we need to do is to change the branch net. So now we input these eigenfunctions of the Cartesian loev, and then the trunk net is one-dimensional space, but the parametric space is five-dimensional. So we are into the R6. And it turns out not only we can learn the statistics, the correct statistics, we can learn individual trajectories. Here I show for ten different random seeds. I show comparison using this with polynomial chaos or different methods. Okay, I'm almost done here. Have one more interesting application, uh, one and a half. Okay, so I want now to do physical problems. I want to learn, I want to simulate tiny bubbles, which become bu big bubbles and large bubbles. Now, tiny bubbles, you need molecular dynamics. Large bubbles, we can simulate them with the israeli plesse equation. Remember, I don't need math here. I just need them to, if I have a video of this, I could use the video, but, but I, gener I use this equation to generate data. So, so I want to predict the radius of the bubble as a function of the pressure. So the pressure delta P will be a function of T, and I want to find this. So here I take my depot net, which will bump the pressure to R. I will do it for, let's say, 100 bubbles, 100 trajectories, and then for, new, for, three, for different cases, there are three different cases here, you can see. And arbitrary pressure, not nice pressure. You can see it's arbitrary pressure. I get this multi-rate dynamics of the bubble. It, the, the bubble oscillates, it breathes, and then it decays because of viscosity. Uh, and that agrees with solving directly the... So I don't have... Of course, again, my cost here is 0.1 seconds. The Rayleigh plus equation is not expensive, but if you try to do what I'm trying to do, namely, I want to have to start from small bubbles, tiny bubbles, to go to big bubbles. So the Rayleigh plus A will be here. And here I need to do molecular dynamic simulation. One of these simulations with a nanobubble will take about one day to do. And then, as you know, those who do multi-scale modeling, I've been doing this for a long time, you have to do handshaking. Handshaking, never good. Never good. You have to do a lot of work here. No, and this, this takes one day, this takes one uh, minute, how do you reconcile these differences and the time scales and so on? So we said, can DeepoNet learn both? So DeepoNet can also learn if we feed it with mole molecular dynamics data. This is called the dissipative particle dynamics, so, so to, which is better for for us, um, 
not so tiny bubbles. But it's like stochastic molecular dynamics. You can see here that it can learn also that regime. Can it learn both simultaneously? So now we feed the neural network with, this is my domain. This is the original bubble domain, R0. And you can see it goes from 100 nanometers to, to, to millimeters. And then this is the time here. And, and you need to be very careful because you're spanning two and orders of magnitude in, in, in time and, and length scale, uh, four, four orders of magnitude. So you actually train this in this wedge domain because this wedge domain is always five characteristic times. Anyway, uh, so to make this, uh, but after you train the neural network where you feed it both with, with data from the continuum and the molecular, then you see here the predictions for new cases, unseen data in the atomistic regime does very good job. In the continuum regime does very good job. In the buffer region, the handshaking region does a very, very good job. So this is now the first, in my, in my, in, to the best of my knowledge, the first seamless multi-scale operator where we don't actually do handshaking. We just feed the depot net with data and it will choose the right representation. You need some overlapping. And finally, this is a DARPA project. There's a lot of interest in, in hypersonics right now. Uh, how do you do hypersonics? They're very expensive, even with... Um, so we work uh, with Olaf Markson, who has published a paper using CFD before. So we use the CFD data just as uh, to train a depot net. Uh, but you can see here there's a dissociation, there's chemistry and so on. So you have to do non-equilibrium chemistry, which is very difficult. It gives you a, 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 a very, very small time step. So the question is, can we learn the shocks? You can see here, I can start with in different initial conditions. So I use the code uh, WINO from my colleague, Brown Ching Wan Shu, and I have chemistry. That, that's what limits the time step to 10 to the minus eight. So I, I, I use his code to generate data. I pretend I don't know any math, but I generate data for different pressure initial conditions, different Riemann pro problems. And I make this, basically I make, uh, this, uh, this is my input function now, because the deponet needs functions. And then, um, I vary the thickness of the sharpness in this uh, discontinuity, and um, I can treat, I can, I can train neural networks for different distributions of all the species I carry and the velocity in one shot to get what I want in one shot. Okay, so I, of course, this is the offline training in one shot. As you can see here, the black line, black line is the initial condition. This is unseen data, and then the red line and there's an underneath the uh, WINO solution, we get within 10 to the minus five accuracy of this, but only in 0.1 second. So we have a speed up compared even to the 1D, WINO 10,000 times speed up. In 2D and 3D, you get 100,000 times speed up for this type of problems. And this is my very last slide. This work I do with uh, Charles Menevo um, uh, and, and Tamer Zaki and, and the postdocs. Um, so we're, we're looking at the stability or instability of boundary layers in hypersonic Mach number 8 to 10. Okay, so, so here on this panel, what you see is pressure measurements. So now we know that there's coatings. You, I, you can actually have uh, continuous temperature or pressure uh, from coatings by painting a, a surface um, uh, with, with some uh, special coatings. This is just a discrete pressure sensors, let's say, pitot tubes. Now, knowing this, I can train a depot net, a, what I call inverse depot net, to find for me what is the free stream inflow, the disturbances. We're looking actually at, at PSC, parabolized stability equations. Okay, we try to mimic with depot net. So, but of course, this is the ultimate inverse problem. I have some pressure measurements downstream. Can I find the free stream disturbances? After I do that, now I use the forward depot net and I can predict a full 3D field downstream as I show you here. How long does it take? On, for online, it takes 0.1 second here. And of course it takes 0.1 second here. So 0.2 seconds to go from pressure measurements, discrete pressure, me pressure measurements, very realistic, that's what DARPA wants, that's what the uh, Defense Department here wants, two realistic 3D reconstructions of field, um, clearly and literally, since this hypersonic, on the fly. Of course, all the work is done offline, that's what you uh, amortize. 
Um, I don't have time to talk about this great work from ETH. It's a 120 paper, 20 pages paper on the theory that basically removes the need for continuous operators. The G can be discontinuous. Also, uh, the space V can be um, it can be non-compact, and in fact, they prove uh, that depot nets, the only network that can break the curse of dimensionality in approximating very general nonlinear operators. But I want to, to leave you with something from England, and that's from the DeepMind. DeepMind apparently loves depot net. They wrote uh, an article about it recently in, in Nature, and they said that depot net uh, can take any experimental data and with numerical data, match it together and so on. And, and most importantly, deponet it opens up exciting opportunities uh, where no analytical expressions, uh, descriptions exist uh, for social dynamics and so on. And uh, I'd like to thank my sponsors. This is the Film Center we put together. I'm the director of it, a big consortium, the biggest consortium on physics informed learning. We started a few years ago. And we recently started another effort on uh, learning and meta learning of uh, uh, using pin uh, physics informed neural networks and also pins with a single N refers to my uh, good uh, collaborator, Human Ohwadi, who is pushing hard the kernels, physics informed networks. You can do regression not just with neural networks, you can do regressions with uh, smart kernels using Gaussian uh, uh, processes like he has been doing and, and other people have been doing. But, uh, but uh, here I talked about um, only about. Uh, uh, neural network. So I think I will stop here and I'll take some, so I'll have some time for questions. Well, thank you very much, George, for the, for the very nice talk. I mean, a little warm <laughs> applause. Uh, we have some questions and please, please do in the audience, if you have any questions, just type in a question in the Q&A uh, or in the chat. I will read it out for you. So we have a question from um, Subahayan D. Um, um, they have a couple of questions on deep one net. The first one is, can we perform extrapolation beyond the input values for which the deep one net was trained? Yeah, that's, that's a very, very good question. That's uh, DARPA asked me, I said, okay, you, you train this between Mach number eight and 10. Now all of a sudden my pilot has to go Mach number 13, what happens? Um, so so we, we have a paper called Deep m, &M M for multi-physics and, uh, and multi-scale. And there we, we add, we have the, the depot nets as building blocks like you saw there, but then we assimilate new data. You, you have to have, there are two ways of, of, of going beyond outside the distribution of the space V. Uh, basically that's the question, how you can go outside the space V. Uh, there, there are two ways of, of doing that. One is to actually use pins because after you train this, and you use pins like doing transfer learning. So you're almost there. Now, if, the if you don't have the equations, you need to have some measurements. So, so the, the, the DARPA people told us, they ha we have some data from these uh, hypersonic flights, but we only have four data on pressure and five data on velocity. And we actually use another uh, neural network to assimilate the data. So we're now looking at mismatch of operators plus mismatch on data. And, and that's how you, remember pins, I have a mismatch in, in the differential in, in, in the functions, right? The solution that satisfies the differential equation plus the data. Now I have mismatch of operators themselves plus the data and I can do that and I can do it very quickly, not 0.1 second, but maybe maybe uh, one second or something like that. Great, and the second question from um, the same person is, can we use the deep one net to learn a parametric uh, operator with uncertain parameters? Yes, of course, uh, you, you can learn that. You can, uh, uh, you can use pins for that. Pin, pins can do a very good job in, in learning. If it's parametric, you can do or pins, you can learn very accurately. In fact, I would say for those out there, this is the primary use of, um, of pins, solving not only, not only the um, parameters, but actually um, we have several papers now. We show how you can find the missing physics. For example, I, remember I show you the ultrasound case with real data? we found the velocity C as a function of X and Y. For that, we assign a different neural network. We didn't parameterize it. I could have parameterized to say that that's like a, an expansion, but I didn't parameterize it. The, I, I added a neural network. We just submitted some, uh, uh, some work for um, uh, these uh, pins for epidemics. And we wanted basically to prove that all 
uh, all epidemiological models are wrong. <laughs> and then we, so, so we didn't parameterize anything. We said, we're going to discover it from data. Okay, and, and we can measure the uncertainties. All models, 10 different models. So we have different, different neural networks for all the parameters. Guess what? None of the parameters that people use are actually the parameters suggested by the data. <laughs> so, so yes, uh, if, if there was one, one use, good use of pins, the number one would be parameter estimation or, or function discovery because it solves the inverse problem much better. And the reason... There's multiple reasons. One is, if you have some data, you help tremendously the optimizer. And so then the cost is really, like for example, remember when I, was, I said, where is the hole for the solid mechanics problem? That's a different problem, difficult problem because the topology is changing, right? So you have to build grids and so on. We don't do that, of course. Now, for us, it took one hour to find where the hole is. I have to say that if I solve the forward problem, it also takes me an hour. If I use Abacus for the forward problem, Abacus will do it in two to five minutes. So my forward problem is a much, much slower than Abacus. But the inverse problem, because I don't have to change anything, the inverse in the forward problem is exactly the same. It also takes me one hour. That's why I would recommend if, st stick with your CFD solvers. Uh, but if you want, unless you want offline to train it and do transfer learning, Pins are expensive in the forward mode the first time, but extremely expensive for inverse problems. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, thank you. And there is a question also from uh, Victoria Kurushina, and um, they are asking whether you need to apply any kind of scaling uh, between the data fit and the residual errors. I think uh, they are referring to pins, but I'm not entirely sure. Scaling, yeah, whatever it is, scaling is extremely important. Um, because of the 32-bit um, arithmetic, because of uh, how the, you, add th you add up things in, in the loss function and, and because of the uh, stochastic optimization solver. So, but scaling normalization and scaling is extremely important. Obviously, I, I show the example with the nano bubble and the milli bubble, unless you introduce the characteristic time scale. So you still need to, to know some physics. That's why I have to tell all these people. You still need to know some physics and some turbulence. Somebody asked me, should we teach people, our, our students, turbulence? Uh, El Gubashi <laughs> I was giving a talk at UCI. I said, should we have it? I said, no, 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 no. You, you, need, you need to scale properly all this. Otherwise, you get nonsense. In fact, we did a Lattice Boltzmann case, uh, like a, a neural network for Lattice Boltzmann. And we had to do some sort of asymptotics first to get the scaling right with a relaxation parameter, one over tau in the right-hand side, to do it properly. Otherwise, we get totally wrong. We get totally wrong answers. So in all this, in all this business, and it's a huge warning, you can, get, you can compute the answer. You can compute fast the, the, answer, the wrong answer really fast. So be careful. <laughs> because you, the, because your, your neural network will die right at, at the onset and, and you convert something which is totally wrong, you're not going to get out of it. Okay, so, that, so, there's, so you have to be very careful. All right, thanks. I think a uh, very, very quick question as a final question. So um, we've got a question from Fernando Gonzalez. They are asking whether you used also more complex neural networks, for example, LSTMs, which I think you did because you presented the example, or convolutional neural networks, for example. Yes, good question, good question, Fernando. Uh, we have a case where we're looking at biomechanics of, um, of our dissections, for example, and we get videos. We get videos from our collaborators. They sacrifice lots of mice, how this opens up. So we use a CNN, the, 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 the branch network. The input is now a CNN, it's a video. We use a CNN there, and we use FN, FNN on the uh, fully connected network on the uh, on the on the on the branch. So you can mix them up. You can use auto encoders. You can use uh, a lot of different uh, things. But about LSTM, uh, I, I have a slide. I didn't show it. We compare for the for the bubble case for the continuous case. I compare with LSTM. LSTM can do a, a good job, but it needs ten times more data. I could do that with 20 points in per trajectory, I could find the right dynamics because you, you, you remember the dynamics was like fast dynamics and then decay because of the viscosity, the bubble. Uh, with LSTM, I had to go to 200 points per trajectory to do the same, but it would do the same. Uh, other people ask me, uh, the reviewers, uh, 
I think one of the reviewers was was from Deep Deep Mind, and, and they asked this uh, other questions also. How about um, sequence to sequence, which is a more sophisticated uh, Google product for operators for and uh, for natural language processing? We actually compare with sequence to sequence could work in some cases. Uh, LSTM cannot work in all these cases instead of DeepOnet because we DeepOnet allows you to do random sampling. Mm -hmm. Totally random sampling, and uh, and so, so and of course in complex geometries and so on, you cannot use CNNs, you cannot use LSTM and so on. Sequence to sequence is a little more sophisticated, but again, sequence to sequence does not exhibit uh, the, the exponential convergence. You can do also what Andrew Stewart has been doing using parametric, a sort of PCA at the input, PCA at the output. You can do that again. That works well. For limited cases, you cannot. You, uh, it's, it's it's a parametric case, not not like non-parametric, but but that works well. So there are other ways of of uh, doing the depot net, but um, uh, but there are some advantages using depot net, and there's some disadvantages also. Excellent. Um, I think there are other questions, but I think time uh, is up. I don't know, Mark, if you if you want to continue with questions or. So. I think we have a hard finish at 5.15, so we do have about another okay. eight minutes or so. so. I'm happy, I'm happy to stay, yeah. Excellent, Thanks, George. There is a, a technical question on stiffness by uh, from Andres Hernandez, and uh, they are asking whether you uh, have encountered the differential equations, uh, meaning if you, if you apply the framework to uh, differential equations like fourth order differential equations or stiff equations for which- Yeah. yeah encountered some some problems in the convergence or the term. yeah we, we work with phase field so we we we, uh, we had fourth order equations and so on the higher the or the the order the, the equation you have to be a little more careful because with the automatic differentiation every time you take a um, derivative effectively you you increase the depth of the of the neural network so you start with 10, 10 layers you end up with 40 layers or, or, or more now this is a very good question about stiffness uh, and that um, my, my student Paris Perdicaris, who is now professor at UPenn, he um, has uh, done a couple of papers on that. Uh, he analyzed that systematically. And let's say the boundary layer, uh, boundary layer could bring you stiffness. It could be, stiffness could be from, from anything. What you need to do in that case, you need to have dynamic weights in front in the loss function. And, the, and, 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 uh, and there's uh, formulas, explicit formulas that Paris and his student Sifan Wang had produced, where you um, uh, you compute this. Uh, we did a, a turbulence simulation. Uh, we tried to do like DNS of turbulence using neural network, which is an open question. And we had to also adjust the weights dynamically um, as uh, during a training and then also during the the, uh, the simulation, uh, because and so the, the the weight will improvise for that dynamic weight that changes during so. Uh, but but it, it is another way to do that is with x-pin. With x, -pin, imagine you have boundary layer, you have or an interface, and you have stiffness there, right? Because that's where all these higher order operators you have to put Dirichlet boundary conditions to give you this uh, structure. Then you take a, a x-pin and you put a very very small domain there, and you sample accordingly. So so there are ways to uh, to address it. It's an issue, uh, the issue of of multi scale also, also like um, because. All neural networks are spectrally biased, just like Fourier methods. They learn the lower the lower frequencies first. So then, so you have to introduce other features, like uh, for example, in the input you can put a basis like sine omega, omega k omega, sorry omega x and omega can be in a certain frequency that will be let's say in the trunk or the input. So it allows you to go to. But there are many ways. You, partition of unity. I've seen some people. Are doing partition of unity, so the multi-scale and the, and the stiffness that uh, 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 Hernandez, I think, uh, answered the question. That these are important issues still under development. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. So, and uh, there is a question from atmospheric um, uh, audience. So, Rui Huang is. Uh, they are asking whether um, you use the Deep One Net for atmospheric dynamics, learning atmospheric dynamics based on the meteorological parameters for precipitation forecasting. I think it's a uh, very specific question, but uh, since you presented a lot of diverse applications. No, it's a good question. I, 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 that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, we can collaborate. We just wrote a, a proposal. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm one third of my uh, appointments with the PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Lab. 
So there they have a, a, a very good uh, center for atmospheric research. So we started working on, on this and we just uh, uh, wrote a proposal on exactly these clouds and, and other, uh, and, and, and we work with real data and we actually have a fleet of airplanes. They, they just bought a, an airplane. So, so they do measurements, they go and they have drones and they take data and so on. ARM, A-R-M, you can look it up. But yes, we, we are working on that. And also I have a project with um, at MIT on Boston Harbor and ocean acidification. So we, we uh, work a lot on collecting data, chemical data, uh, but also, uh, you know, salinity, temperature, and so on from satellites and uh, and uh, in situ measurements from the authorities, but also from lobster, lobstermen and, and fishermen. Like they have the best data because the only ones who have data temperature in the bottom of the ocean where the, the good Boston fish hatch. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, um, any, data, any data is good. And uh, what about uh, Ray? They're asking whether quantum entanglement, did you try to tackle quantum problems? Yet? No, that's that's beyond my, my uh, understanding. I, I uh, that's that's I, I know some people are interested in this and they have asked me this question and uh, I'm, I'm my bandwidth is limited to cannot go quantum. Okay, <laughs> I had actually a final question uh, before we get uh, cut out probably and um, a couple of questions actually. You mentioned that you want to measure uh, and you you need at some point to measure the differences in operators in uh, in deep one nets and. Um, is, is the performance of the network uh, um, um, very sensitive to the norm you used for the, you know, the norm? Yeah, the, the yeah, 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 yes, yeah. that's so where the mathematics can. Uh, would you choose yeah. for the policy you said? Yeah, for, for example, for this continuous solution, uh, you, you, it's better to use MAE, like the, uh, the uh, L1 type error. Or, uh, or uh, some, uh, so so uh, one of our projects, and you saw in the MURI we call learning and meta-learning. One of our projects is actually to meta-learn the loss function, the proper loss function. Yeah. So you don't have to go with MSC. There is something, if you're interested in this, in this field, it's called the Baron. Baron from Google uh, Brain wrote a very nice paper where he has parameterized the loss function. So you can go from L infinity to L1 to L2 and so on with different parameters. And then, But what we actually have a much broader framework where we have a neural network to learn what is the proper loss function. And on, on the fly also it can change it. It could be expensive, but, um, uh, but MSC turns out for smooth is pretty good. For discontinuous solutions, um, MAE or relative. For example, in the multi-scale operator, I'll show you with the tiny bubbles, the relative MAE, we use the relative MAE norm. Mm -hmm. Right, the mean, mean absolute error, not the MSC would not do it. So yes, it, it's important, and the weighted norms also weighted norms, as I said, dynamic weights, but also the type of norm. I think it's important. I think I think there's quite a bit of room for improvement there, um, because that, of course, will affect the. Um, and one one more thing that I didn't I didn't talk about here, but we published a lot of papers, is on, uh, with theory is on adaptive activation functions. That's how we. We, we, did, we did that in the hackathon problem I said for DARPA uh, and we, pub we publish it now. So basically, uh, instead of having one, all neurons act, uh, firing at the same rate, right? Because of uh, one activation function, you can make every neuron have its own activation function by parameterize the, let's say the slope of the hyperbolic tangent, right? So, so we, we did a paper in Proceedings of Royal Society and we have a theory that shows if you do that, then you actually guarantee that you will never get trapped into a bad minimum. It doesn't tell you that you will only get to the, to, the, to the global maximum, okay? But at least you're not gonna get trapped into a bad minimum that you'll never get out of it. Yeah. So, so, so there's a theory for that, but the adaptive activation function will accelerate. Uh, it works really well for multi-scale problems and, and the stiff problems that uh, uh, one of the, um, Attendees ask the question about uh, yeah, that's why activation function. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, George. I think uh, um, I would uh, finish here just uh, in order not to get cut out, uh, uh, you know, uh, and minimize the risk for that. Uh, so yeah. I personally would like to thank you. I enjoyed your talk a lot, and I would have a, a gazillion of questions, but uh, maybe another time. And uh, I will hand over to Mark if he wants to 
uh, wrap up the webinar. And Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much, George. So, George, I'd just like to, to echo Luca's thanks. That, that was absolutely inspiring, um, quite breathtaking, um, and, and really, really exciting. So I'm sure the 200 odd people that actually uh, uh, joined us, um, and certainly with the, the level of questions that have been asked, um, you've given us lots of really inspiring uh, things to, to go away and think about uh, and, and see if we can try and catch up with you at some point or other. Um, so I think it's been great uh, having you here for the first webinar and um, you set an incredibly high bar, um, but I'll just hand over now to, um, well, I'm not sure who, who's, who, who's going to uh, switch us I'm, off, I guess. Yeah, I guess that would be me. So um, I really hope everyone enjoyed it and found it very useful to hear from George. This was a stellar talk um, and learning more about the journal Data Centric Engineering. Um, I'd really like to thank our panellists, Luca, Mark and George for their time and taking part and uh, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you for having me and good luck with the seminar and the journal. I'm, I'm looking forward to also contributing to it. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.